we have any extra batteries back there, Brian? It's working now, but it's blinking, so I may need them in the middle of this lesson. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. We are looking at continuing our study of the Christian graces based out of Second Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> but of course expanding from there as we talk about each individual uh, Christian grace. Thank you, sir. Oh, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I'll just hold on to them. I'll run it till the bitter end. I appreciate uh, Brother Bob Staples filling in last week as I was gone to Jacksonville. Had the opportunity to speak to some uh, young folks over there and some older folks too. I, I taught in the Bible class hour, so I spoke to everybody and got to hear Chris Clevenger preach. I haven't seen Chris in a long time. And so that was a, a good opportunity. Uh, we are, Bob was telling me he, he did kind of a, a brush up on Christian evidences. And so I'm, I'm sure that was good. Bob always does a fantastic job with that. So let's go back now to our, uh, what, we're look, what we were, were looking at with Christian, the Christian grace is talking about virtue. I was looking at my notes here. We, we were talking about, I wanted to go back, <clears throat> we, we, we just hit two of these, two or three of these very, very quickly. We were talking about virtue being, you know, the, the idea of courage, uh, moral courage to do what is right. And, and we left off hurriedly talking about a few different areas. Uh, one of these was, was courage to, to live the gospel. Uh, we don't want to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16. We want to make sure we are courageous in living out the gospel. We, we notice some areas uh, in daily life. The pull of the world is, is strong. That's why talk, Paul talks about in Titus 2, 11 and 12, that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Uh, the pull of the world is strong, so we want to, we, it's going to take virtue, moral courage, fortitude, if we're going to live the gospel in our daily lives, at school, at work, at home, when we're on vacation, and recreational activities and things of that nature, in all areas of our lives, uh, Christianity is not a compartment that is just Sundays and Wednesdays and during a gospel meeting or VBS or whatever it may be. <clears throat> it, is a, it is a way of life. At least it's, it ought to be. Biblically it is. Uh, we talked about courage to live the gospel in dealing with our kids. Sometimes our children need tough love. Joshua 24, 15. God give us more men and especially fathers who will say as Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, there's no question in my mind if, if Mrs. Joshua or Joshua's children had decided to try to do something that was against the will of God that Joshua would have stood up and said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, too often, and it's easy for us to do, but uh, too often men are not stepping up in that role. Sometimes I think uh, we as men don't understand what it means to be the head of the household. Sometimes I think we, we fall into this idea that that means you're, you know, kind of calling the shots, for lack of a better term. Uh, I'm going to tell her what to do, I'm going to tell the children what to do, and uh, I'm going to make the decisions, and, and that, that, you know, the decision-making at least could be a part of it. But the main thing I believe biblically involved in being the head of the home is you are spiritually the guard. I mean, you are the watchdog of that home. I don't, I, I've got to take responsibility. I'm not going to let evil come into my home, whether it be through television, internet, print, music, whatever. Uh, I'm going to make sure that when my children, my wife, go out of the home, that they're acting appropriately, representing us and the Lord's church, and so on, as they ought to. I understand there, there's free will, and, and sometimes you know, people mess up, and so does dad. You know, so does the husband. But understanding that, that that's on me. If I'm the husband, if I'm the father, uh, I've got to give an account one day. Did I do everything in my power to ensure 
my family is following God? If not, I've got an answer for that. And so we talked about that as far as uh, tough love and dealing with our children. You, you, know, you don't need me to tell you, you've heard it before. You know, children have tons of friends. Uh, sometimes parents will say, I want to be a friend to my child. They've got a lot of friends, folks. They don't need another friend. But they only have one mama and they only have one daddy. What, what children need most are their parents. And, and sometimes that, that means uh, tough love and, and standing up. And I, I think I, I did have time to relate. Um, last class that we were in, I think, what was it, two weeks ago, that I was, uh, I was kind of a professional as a teenager at leaning on my parents and trying to wear them down and to giving in to let me do things that they originally said no to and they knew it wasn't the right thing, but I would just press and press and press until finally they would say, you just go do whatever you want. Uh, and, and they did. Obviously, there would have been a limit even to that, but they were giving in for something that they knew wasn't right. And, and you know, children can do that, and that's, uh, that's the challenge in, in having that virtue in dealing with our children. Um, also, in dealing with our Christian brothers and sisters, uh, there are times when we're going to have differences because we're people. And sometimes we disagree. Sometimes <clears throat> it may even be that a brother or sister has sinned. We need to handle that. Uh, we need to have virtue, moral courage, or fortitude in dealing with our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, sometimes knowing when to let it go. Sometimes knowing that even though it's not the easy thing to do, I've got to go talk to this brother. Um, ask an elder in the Lord's church. They'll tell you that is not an easy task. Sometimes the elders have to go sit down with a brother or sister or sometimes even uh, a husband and wife as a couple and say, you're, you're not where you need to be spiritually. You're in a, you're in a dangerous spot. That is a challenge. Um, in fact, you know, I said ask any elder, and they'll tell you, and certainly that's the case, but ask an elder's wife, and they'll tell you. Because many times the elders' wives have to be there and, and sort of be moral support when their husbands can't sleep, uh, they're stressed to the max because they're, they're worried about how this situation is going to turn out because they take very seriously the Lord's admonition to watch over the souls of the congregation. Uh, it's not an easy situation. It's also not easy in an individual situation when you know somebody's done wrong and, and you have to go tell, you tell them something that you know they don't want to hear. And sometimes that you know they're not going to like. But we know what we need to do many times. So we need courage or virtue in dealing with those situations. Uh, we also need courage, virtue to teach the gospel. We've talked about this a lot and uh, I, think, I think we cannot overemphasize it because it is, it is, those are the marching orders of the church. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so we need courage to go and teach the gospel. Sometimes we're afraid we'll lose a friend or lose a, uh, a, the, the relationship we have with a family member. Sometimes we're, um, I think a lot of times we just, we, we know deep down, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. And so I don't go and teach anyone. Uh, you know, the idea of I don't know what I'm talking about, that's, that's, a, an, that's rectifiable. The, the answer is I need to study. I need to grow in knowledge. And then I can go and teach. But sometimes I think that's, the, that's what causes us not to have that courage. Sometimes we're just afraid we'll fail. I, I think, I think there'll be, we would probably be surprised, maybe not, but I think there are a shocking number of folks that don't try to teach others the gospel just because they're afraid they'll fail. Nobody likes rejection. But what we have to remember in those situations is just simply that our job is not to go and convert the world. What's our job? Just sow the seed. Plant the seed. Uh, God gives the increase. Uh, you know, I've told y'all before what Tim Wilkes used to say in our Fishers of Men class, and it stuck with me, and it's so true. He says, you do your job. And let God do his job. Uh, sometimes we get all tore up because something didn't happen that, that's really not our responsibility. Uh, you know, that happened with Samuel when the people asked for a king. 1 Samuel chapter 8. They, they want a king to be like all the nations, and Samuel's all torn up about that. And God says, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. So our job is to sow the seed. And, 
you know, I, I know that doesn't necessarily make it easier to accept that rejection, and, and sometimes when you just feel like your best efforts go just unnoticed or unappreciated by someone you're trying to help spiritually. But remember, our job is to plant the seed. God, God is the one who gives the increase. Um, by the way, I may try to mention this tonight if I think about it, but a lot of times I forget. This, this reminded me, um, talking about planting the seed, uh, sometimes I get, uh, sometimes you can get discouraged or disheartened when you're doing something like um, you're trying to teach someone and you wonder, is anybody, is anybody paying attention? And I, I, I sort of, uh, we, we've been doing these one minute radio spots for a while and uh, don't, don't get a, a large amount of feedback and sometimes you wonder, is anybody listening to those? But uh, one of our members here at Bremen uh, sent me a message, I think this was Thursday, uh, sent me a message on Facebook, uh, said she was at Walmart and I forget how it came about, but uh, it was just, just someone from the community that said they had they had heard one of the one-minute spots and said they appreciated it very much and uh, the lady invited her to come and maybe visit worship or something sometime and uh, it said she was very, very complimentary of that. So that's, uh, that's nice to know that at least the message is getting out there. I got a, a same day, I got a message from Luke Griffin. Luke works uh, with House to House, Heart to Heart. He's one of the people who helps put that out and also is very involved in polishing the pulpit. And Luke said... Uh, he, he said, hey, I want to tell you something. I was driving home from Atlanta Wednesday night, or it might have been Tuesday night, and uh, he said, uh, this, this religious commercial came on the radio, and, and he said, I, I, I started thinking, this, this sounds different. Uh, I said, some, some, this guy doesn't sound like most of those. And he said, then, uh, he said, I was real pleased when I heard you give the website for the Bremen Church. And he said, uh, now, now Luke's a member of the church, obviously, but he said, I just wanted you to know that, uh, he said, one of the things I want to tell you was the message is distinct. And he said, that stands out. He said it was almost immediately. And that's one of the things the elders told me when we started this. They said, we want these messages not to just be uh, something, you know, that just sounds like anything else you might hear. We want to try to have a distinction that will, if nothing else, make people think. Uh, so sometimes we, we can get discouraged and uh, you know, even in a situation like that, something as small as a little one-minute spot, sometimes uh, I wrote Luke back and I said, you know, I said, I really appreciate that encouragement because for the past week or two or three, I've, I've gotten very little, if any, feedback on those, and I'm just kind of, you know, sometimes you just start thinking, are people hearing this? Are they listening? Do they care? Um, but again, our job is just to sow the seed, uh, and that's, that's hard to remember sometimes, but uh, God give us virtue, courage to teach the gospel and just to do our job and put the seed out there, plant it, and let God give the increase. Also, courage to stand up for the gospel. We could talk about that in context of preachers, preaching the word, 2 Timothy 4.2. Uh, elders, uh, again, shepherding the flock and, and taking the necessary steps when someone goes astray, taking the necessary steps to keep the congregation sound and pure and, and so on and so forth. Uh, letting the congregation know that we will follow the New Testament and only the New Testament, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, that's, that's a challenge, and it takes a lot of courage to do that, especially when, you know, sometimes you get into a situation, and uh, I've seen it happen in congregations. Maybe there's someone who is wealthy. Maybe there's uh, a particular family who they form a large part of the membership, or maybe there's a family who has a lot of wealth, and they start start leaning on the eldership. We don't like this, or we want to do that, and we're going to, you know, it'd be a shame if we had to start cutting our contribution, or it'd be a shame if we, we just took our group and went elsewhere. I've even seen it where it wasn't necessarily family. It was just kind of a, I guess for lack of a better term, a click. And they, you know, start trying to bully the eldership into doing what they want that's not really something that ought to be done. It was not something that was best for the congregation, but they start trying to bully, saying, well, you know, there's a lot of us, and if we went elsewhere, boy, you, you'd really be, you, your numbers would go down, your contribution would go down. God give us elders who are virtuous, courageous enough to say if everybody in the congregation leaves, we're not going astray from the New Testament. That's, that's what we need. Yes, sir.
And I've made that point many times from John 6 that, you know, when the people start departing, Jesus doesn't just, Jesus doesn't say, ho, 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 y'all, let, let's talk about this. Let's, you know, maybe we could reach a compromise here. Maybe we could, you know, he, he just, he says, you know, the truth is the truth. And, and it's not going to change. Brother Brinkley says the truth is a stubborn thing. He says it's like an old weed. You know, you, you, you try to stamp it out and it, it just comes right back sometimes. Um, I, I was talking about this with somebody recently and we were talking about uh, the truth. And I, I use the illustration, truth is like a, uh, a patch of Bermuda grass growing in your garden. <laughs> it's about that hard to get rid of. Uh, if you want Bermuda grass, plant a garden. We used to try to grow that stuff in the yard sometimes. Uh, when I was growing up, you'd have these bare patches in the yard and you'd try to plant Bermuda grass and baby it and all that and get it to grow and it won't. But if you want it to grow, plant a garden, and you'll have all the Bermuda grass you'll ever need. And you can pull that stuff up and think you got it by the root, and it'll just come right back. Truth is stubborn. It's not going away. And, and we can deny it. We can try to get around it. We can ignore it. But it's still the truth. And Jesus never apologized. That's a very good point. He never apologized for the truth. And that leads me to the next part, and that's courage for every member of the Lord's church. Now, we all need the courage to stand for what's right. Uh, it's, it's tempting whether, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's my daughter or it's my son, and sometimes people start, uh, they start hedging a little bit on something. Uh, maybe it's my mother or father, or maybe it's uh, someone else that I'm very close to, or, you know, maybe it's a discussion at work or at school where I'm feeling ganged up on, and so I kind of start to hedge a little bit. And, but we need courage to stand for what's right and, and realize that the truth's not going anywhere. And I don't have to be ugly about it. I don't have to be arrogant. I don't have to be rude. But I can just say I may be outnumbered 10 to 1 in a discussion at work. Maybe they're talking about, you know, the hot topic lately has been, uh, I hate to even call it same-sex marriage. It's not marriage. It'll never be marriage. But, you know, the Supreme Court's been uh, debating that. Still, still no decision, right? Uh, some of you folks that uh, follow the news more closely than I do. But they've been debating that, and there's been a lot of talk and, one guy on a website that I'm on with a bunch of uh, preachers and folks that write for uh, things religiously, he, one preacher has posted uh, letters to the editor that he's written in his hometown, I believe, in Ohio, uh, and he got one really nasty response from a man who uh, was, he, he said in the response that he's married to another man, and of course he didn't like this letter to the editor, and the guy was, the, the preacher who was writing the letter to the editor originally was very courageous but he handled it in a very good way. Uh, you know, sometimes we can be outnumbered on some of these things, whether in an individual situation. Uh, sometimes it, it may be even as a state or as a country, there are a lot of folks stacked against you. But truth is truth. And that's what this man was pointing out to this, this fellow who had the nasty response. He said, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you're a second-class citizen. I'm not saying you're less than me. I'm better than you. I'm saying it's not right. It's just not right. And nature itself tells you it's not right, aside from the Bible. And the truth is the truth. And whether, whether you're talking about homosexual so-called marriage or whether you're talking about fornication between a man and a woman or whether you're talking about drugs and alcohol, whether you're talking about the fact that a person must be baptized into Christ to have his sins washed away and to be added to the Lord's kingdom and to be able to go to heaven. All those things, truth is the truth. And, and, and again, we don't need to be arrogant. We don't need to be uh, rude. But I, I can't apologize for the truth. I've said that here before. I, I've said that in numerous places. Uh, I don't ever want to come across as, um, as, as being ugly or unkind and I try my best not to, but I cannot and I will not apologize for the truth of God Almighty. I, I just won't. Uh, the day that we do, we've lost our virtue. We've lost that moral courage. So we need, we need courage to stand for what is right. Uh, and then finally, courage to confess when we stray from the truth. We, we could talk about numerous examples of that. Um, Simon the sorcerer comes to mind, Acts chapter 8. He, he had the courage to, when he when Peter says, you're, you're in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity. He says, pray that none of these things come, come upon me. He, he wanted to make that right. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We, that, that sometimes takes some moral fortitude, does it not? Uh, 
I've, I've not seen it personally, but I heard a preacher, uh, I think it was one of my instructors in preacher school, and he talked about a man in the congregation where he was preaching at one time that had he'd never become a Christian. He knew what he needed to do. He just had put it off, put it off, put it off. And, and this brother talked about how numerous times during the invitation he could, he could see that man. I guess he was up toward the front or whatever, but he could see that man and he would grab the back of the pew in front of him during the invitation song. And he said there were a couple of times, I don't know, maybe he preached a sermon that particularly hit that guy and made him realize what he needed to do, but he said he could see him holding on to the back of the pew in front of him. He said there were times when his knuckles were just white, uh, times when the hands were just shaking because he's just gripping the pew so hard. And it was like if he let go, he was coming forward. But he said the man never let go. He just, you know, sometimes it takes courage to say, you know, I, I, can't, I can't save myself. I can't do this on my own. I need the Lord. Sometimes it takes courage, I guess maybe especially you might say for a man because sometimes men tend to feel like we can do everything and we, we, we've got to be self-sufficient. Sometimes it takes courage just to say, you know, I was, I was wrong about something. Sometimes folks have gone away from the Lord's church for years. I know a preacher who... He went away for years. He, he left his wife. Uh, he married another woman that he had no right to marry, biblically. And he attended a denomination for many, many years because the denomination said, your, your new marriage is okay. And he knew the Lord's church would not go along with that. And this went on for a long time. And finally, one day, there was a meeting, and an old friend of his came in. This guy had been a preacher. An old friend of his came in to preach a gospel meeting, and at some point during the meeting, he went out and made a visit to him. So I said, you know, so-and-so, he lives, he lives right here in town. So he said, Let, let's go out and talk to him. N nothing fancy, just, just said, you know, hey, what, what's, what's going on? What's it going to take? And they talked a little bit, and really no, no particular indication from that visit. But that night he came to the meeting, and even then the preacher didn't really think much of it because they, they were old buddies. He thought, well, he'll come and hear me preach. But the man actually came forward. He'd been in that town for a long time. Everybody knew that was the guy who had left his wife. He used to preach the gospel. He left his wife. He remarried unscripturally. And now he goes to some denomination because they'll let him come there and be in full fellowship. You think that didn't require some courage? Everybody knew. I've seen situations where teenage girls messed up. They went and committed fornication and ended up with child. Everybody knows, especially if it's a small town. Word gets around, you know. Everybody knows. And this girl, she wants to do the right thing. She made a mistake. She knows it. She wants to make her life right. You think that requires some courage to step out and go down front and say, I messed up publicly and I need the forgiveness and the prayers of the church. But God give us people who have the courage, virtue, to do what is right. Even though it may be humiliating, it may make us feel uh, uncomfortable, what at right is always right, and wrong is always wrong. It's never right to do wrong, and it's never wrong to do right. This is all entailed in virtue. Being a person of virtue, it's, it's not out of our reach. It involves just deciding that I'm going to stick with the truth come what may. Doesn't mean I'll never make a mistake in that area. Lord knows we all do, right? My hair, Chad included. We all fall short in that area sometimes, but when we do, let's have the courage to say, hey, I fell short. I'm going to learn from this, and I'm going to do better in the future. Let's move on and talk a little bit about knowledge. A lot to say about knowledge. Some of these Christian graces, I've, I've got more material I want to cover than others. Uh, knowledge is one that I've got a little bit more material than some of the others, but I think, it's, <clears throat> I think it's necessary. We're to add to our faith virtue and then to virtue knowledge. We've talked about faith, we've talked about virtue, we've talked about you know, introducing, I guess, for lack of a better term, the Christian graces. But who, who says add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge? I mean, Peter, obviously, right? But who says it? God. God. God says this. My point in that is, it's not, 
It's not Peter saying, look, uh, I've been thinking about this, and I think this might be a good idea. Uh, this, is, this is God Almighty, the omniscient, omnipotent being, the God, who says, do this. It's an imperative. I want us to understand that because, you know, let's, let's don't beat around the bush. By and large, we're not where we ought to be with our knowledge of the Word of God. Agree or disagree? I, th I think we would have to admit that's the case. It's not the case for everybody, but you look at the Lord's church as a whole, the people who of all people ought to know the book, and we don't know it as well as we ought. And, and the, the, the shame of that is, that's a simple solution. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a quick solution, but it's a simple solution, and the simple solution is get in the book. One of the things that I tell young preachers, if I ever have a chance to speak to young preachers and, and try to encourage them, one of the things I tell them is, I'm, not, I'm not, trying to, not trying to put down other books that are out there, but get your nose in the book, first and foremost. I, I, I learned this a few years ago. Uh, Frank Chester was one that helped me to learn this. When, when you come in the office and you're going to do your daily Bible reading, and that's, that's usually the first thing I do in the morning, I'm going to read my Bible reading first and get through whatever I've got to get through that day. Sometimes I have to make up for a day when I was out of the office or something. And then if I have time, I'd like to read some of these other books. But if I don't have time, the book comes first. Sometimes even as preachers, we, we get to a, a situation where we don't know the book. And, and how can you preach the book if you don't know the book? And sometimes the book is not what's getting preached. And I think that's why. This is something that we can all work on. And, and I don't care if you're a preacher who studied the Bible in depth and preached it for 50 years. If that man is a true student of the Word of God, he himself would say, there's always more to learn. I've told you before about the illustration of the little girl who came along and every day she'd see her grandmother with her Bible laid out on her lap, reading her Bible. And she came in one day and she said, Grandmother, you still reading that book? You're not finished with it yet? And she said, Honey, you're never finished with this book. You just read it and read it and read it and you keep learning. I, I can't tell you how many times uh, I, I go through the Bible uh, once a year and I try to do two or three times with the New Testament but there's so many times, in fact, it happened just the other day, I can't remember what the passage was, but so many times that you look at a passage and you go, I never caught that before. You see something, and you say, I, I just never noticed that. And, and maybe even it leads you to kind of into a side study, and uh, you, you want to you get more information about this or whatever, but knowledge is, is so important, and yet, again, by and large, I'm not saying it's everybody, I'm not trying to speak for everybody, whether here or elsewhere, but by and large, we're not where we need to be. Uh, there are three kinds of knowledge. What are they? I get that right. There's, there's knowledge that comes from study. That's what we're going to be talking about. But just, just pointing out these, what's, what are the other two? Experience. Experience. Uh, you learn something by experience. That's a hard teacher sometimes, isn't it? And then what's the other kind of knowledge? Well, think about if, if one kind of knowledge comes from study, then the other kind of knowledge that we're looking at, talking about in particular, miraculous. From, you're not studying. It's just, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, that was one of the spiritual gifts when they would lay hands on someone. One of the gifts that sometimes was imparted was knowledge. And what a blessing that was to the early church who doesn't have a New Testament. To, to go through. They had, a, they had an apostle walking Bible, but sometimes the apostles are on missionary journeys and things like that, and they're not at that congregation. So what a blessing to have someone who, upon whom the apostles have laid hands, now he has miraculous knowledge. And, and so if we need to know something about a particular, well, how are we supposed to handle this situation? Or what is the will of God on this? They go to that brother. So there's, there's miraculous knowledge, there's experience or observation, we might even say, and then there's study. We're obviously talking about study. Uh, you, you know I get frustrated. I've, I've mentioned it several times here in other places. Uh, in fact, I think I even did one of the one-minute spots about this. Sometimes people will say, Chad, what do you think about? And then they proceed to ask a Bible question. 
Uh, I, I know what they're asking, and I'm not trying to be nitpicky. Uh, but what really bothers me a lot more than that is when somebody says, or at least of my own brethren, hey, uh, what's the Church of Christ believe about? And then they ask a Bible question. And sometimes I just being, trying to be funny, but also make a point, I'll say, I don't care. What does the Church of Christ teach about baptism? I don't care. And they say, you don't care. And I said, no, I care about what the Bible teaches about it. Oh, you know what I mean. <laughs> and I'll laugh and I'll say, I do know what you mean, but I'm just trying to make a point. It doesn't matter what the Church of Christ teaches about something as if that were some kind of denominational position. If it's Christ's church, they believe about it what the Bible says about it. And if they don't, then they got a problem. Individually, collectively, whatever. And so we, the point in this is when we talk about knowledge, getting away from what does my church believe about such and such? That's another one. I tell people, I don't have a church. I didn't die for any church. My Lord has a church, and I belong to his church, but I don't have a church. Sometimes people will say that, uh, and most time this is not my brethren. Most time it's uh, somebody out in the denomination world. They say, oh, that's real nice. You got you a church over there in Georgia, huh? Sometimes my family members back home who are not Christians. How, how many people go there? I say, well, you know, we'll have... You know, anywhere from 160 to 180 on a Sunday morning, typically depending on who's out of town or whatever and who's visiting. Oh, that's great. That's, a, that's pretty. You got you a pretty good sized church, Chad. We're proud of you. And I know they mean they mean well with that. But I even sometimes point out to them, it's not my church. And I, I would be sinfully presumptuous to come in here thinking that I could call the shots like it's my church. It's the Lord's church. And we need to make sure we understand that. And so all this comes in play with knowledge, being uh, people of the book, as we sometimes say. And so all that is to say that, you know, I want us to think about this study of knowledge with open hearts and minds. You may not like what you hear. You, you may not like it because you realize, you know, I'm not where I need to be with my knowledge of the Word of God. But let's take an honest look. I'm, I'm going to take an honest look at myself. I hope you'll do the same. And let's remember, you know, Galatians 4.16, where Paul says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Uh, sometimes we need to take a long look in the mirror and say, Is this something I need to work on? That's the point of studying all these Christian graces, to take a look at ourselves and say, Where am I? Where do I need to be? How can I get there? Uh, in the time we've got left, let's, let's just notice the fact that God wants us to have and, and to grow in knowledge. We, we see it right here, 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. 1 Peter 2, 2 says what? As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Numerous passages we could talk about. Psalm 1, 1 and 2, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is and the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Meditation, we sometimes think of some kind of, you know, strange... Um, Levi saw it on a show or something recently. I don't know where this came from, but he, he started doing this. I think he does it just to bug me. But he, he likes to go and sit in the living room, cross-legged, and he'll do this. And he'll go, um, <laughs> and close his eyes. And I'll get on to him, and, I'll, and he'll say, I'm meditating. And I'll say, go meditate elsewhere. You're getting on my nerves. But, you know, we think of meditation as that, you know. But that's not what it's talking about. It's just talking about it's something that's on your mind. How often are you thinking about the Word of God? And you think about back to when you met your spouse or when you met someone that you really, really cared about and things start getting serious. They're on your mind all the time. Things that we care about. If you have a sports team, you know, it may not even be football season. But you're, you know, you're watching, who are we going to draft? Is it going to help fill the need that we, that, you know, that, that we have to, to get somebody better in this particular position? And then you start looking as, it, as it's counting down toward the season. And boy, we're looking like we're going to have a pretty good team. And you're following the spring practices and things like that. Maybe even follow preseason. And it's what we care about. We're thinking about it. And the same thing with the Word of God. It's not to say that it's bad to think about those things. That's not, I'm not saying that. Football's... Uh, you know, whatever sports you follow, uh, you know, if, if you follow that in the off season or whatever, that's, that's fine. But we just need to make sure that we have our priorities right.
does, does the word of God occupy my thoughts beyond when I'm in an assembly or in a Bible study with the saints? Jesus, Jesus himself said, what, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus on numerous occasions said, have you not read? Sometimes they would come to him with a problem, whether perceived or otherwise, or maybe they're trying to trick him or trip him up, and Jesus would just go back to the Bible and he would say, have you not read? Sometimes I think maybe we might be better to do that when somebody says, you know, Chad, somebody told me you, uh, you teach baptism is necessary for salvation. Is that, is that true? You teach that? That's, that's work salvation. And I think it might be better instead of trying to, you know, say, well, listen here, let's, you know, and, and start throwing out the arguments. I sometimes wonder if maybe we might not just say, have you not read? And maybe point to a passage of scripture. Of course, you know, as, as uh, Brother Whitaker pointed out, the best thing to do in that situation is try to get it to a Bible study. And then you're, you're just looking at scriptures back to back and, and asking questions just based on those scriptures. But Jesus brought people back to the word of God. Hey, uh, Jesus, you, you know, you, you're kind of becoming controversial and we want to know about this thing about paying tax. Do you, do you believe that? You know, well, we, we got you in a pickle here because if you say yes, then the Jews are going to be upset with you. If you say no, then the Romans are going to be upset with you. And so Jesus says... Bring me the penny. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render unto God the things that are God's. Always taking people back to the scripture. Over and over again when he was tempted, every time when he was tempted by Satan, it is written. We need to be people of the book. Jesus was so often taking people back to the scriptures. What did he say in John 5, 39? Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus says, if you knew your Bible, you'd know I'm the Christ. There wouldn't be any question about it. They didn't know the scriptures. That's the second bell, isn't it? Over and over again, the Bible talks about now understanding what the will of the Lord Sure, everyone was up front. But he really liked all that. And there was a few other little odds and ends about the auditorium too.